Bills don't show up when you're on the road. Reality is not there. Mm -hmm. You are behind the wheel of a car thinking for seven hours straight, how can I make this idea funny? Folks, for 20 years plus we've been coming here and as long as you keep coming back, I'll keep coming trying to find the funniest people in America before they become household names. If you're funny, in Minneapolis and Indianapolis and Houston and Birmingham, if you're funny in Denver and Dallas, being funny in New York or LA isn't very difficult. I'm a Midwest comedy club guy. It's been very difficult to sell stand-up. A lot of clubs rely strictly on big names. We could just sell stand-up. Come see stand-up, doesn't matter who's on the stage. Right around 1999, 2000, the trend became come see a specific comedian. They had to have high exposure. Well, rope comedy is why we got into it in the beginning. Most of us never had a dream past being a headliner, ever. I never thought I'd be on TV. From 19 to 25, all I did was drive to gigs by car. That's how you did comedy, and that's how like, I felt like a comic. And now, Every time I leave Los Angeles, like I feel like people kind of treat me like, oh, you're a road comic. Yeah. I'm like, oh, come on now. There's a whole big country out there, and it doesn't exist in LA. There's plenty of comics in mid America, the guys that have started in all the comedy clubs that are all across America. From the, the West Coast to the East Coast, there's plenty of room in between. The David Letterman guy explained it to me, and I understand it. He said to me, Stuart, let me tell you this. You will never be on David Letterman. That's what he said, and I went, oh, well, thanks. You know, I've done all the auditions, but they keep saying you're a storyteller. They figured out that a comedian with four and a half minutes with just jokes, preferably young who looks hip, and just hit them with jokes. They're on that because they have high-powered management. They're not the actual funniest people. They're not. And the more I thought about it, the more I can kick myself for even doing Star Search because I've always said, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to search for stars. As an anthropologist, to me, it's fascinating. What you can do with an empty stage and just words, and what you choose to do, what people choose to do. This project, I'm looking at stand-up comics who are known in the business as road comics because they drive to gigs. They'll drive to gigs, and they'll be one week in St. Louis, one week in Des Moines one week in Cleveland, one week in Wilmington, Indiana. I think that it's always interesting when people create opportunities for a commentary on themselves and on their situation. I feel really grateful to be in a place where I could see comics that aren't just names that were popularized on TV. The first years are grueling, living out of your car, having no money at all, so it's got to be a reason to sacrifice that much. You've got to love it. And I think if you're going to love anything, it's, a, it's good if it makes you laugh. <laughs> it's a good thing to choose something that makes you laugh. We'll be funny whether you're here or not. You might as well come have a good time. After all, it's cheaper than therapy. All right, now, who likes the environment? Yeah! When I moved out to California, everybody's convincing me to recycle. And uh, a couple weeks ago, I was bragging to my neighbors that I recycle more than anyone else I know. And they were like, yeah, well, Kristen, you drink more than anyone else we know. <laughs> I got all these bottles and cans. I thought it was like earth friendly. They think I'm a fucking alcoholic. So I wrote a song about how I'm earth friendly and an alcoholic. <laughs> yeah! We've only got one planet for us all to live on. And at the rate that things are going, it'll soon be gone. It'll only take a little to help out if everybody pitches in. I like to do my part by drinking, for starters. I like wine and beer and ever clear, but when I'm done, I always put the bottles in a recycling bin. I'm drinking my way to a better tomorrow. I'm saving the earth while I'm drowning my sorrows. Drink one down for me. Don't waste energy and fucking hug a tree. Well, my friend Janet wants to save the planet. She got a DUI, and then she said, damn it, she got all pissed off because it took her driver's license away. I said, well, hey, Janet, that's pretty cool. You won't be driving, won't be wasting any fossil fuels. Looks like black and ounce finally helping out the green. She's drinking one down, trying to save tomorrow. She's saving the earth while she's drowning her sorrows. So drink one down for me. Don't waste energy in the country. All right.
right. Hey guys, how's it going? Good. <laughs> Shit. You guys look disappointed. This is it right here. Yeah, I'm not too happy with this shit myself. To be honest with you. All right, everybody, am I on? Did they tell you guys what's going on? Did you guys like documentary to? thing? We're making a documentary about different types of comedians that are completely, you know, unknown and dirt poor and have a mountain of debt. <laughs> yeah, that's what's going on. And you guys are like the select few that we chose, handpicked. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about, there was 1,500 people that were like, please, we're like, we don't need your dumb ass. <laughs> we need these 11 that are fucking intelligent and we'll get the shit. I was 24 years old. I just decided I'm gonna be a comedian. Consider yourself lucky. <laughs> Looking back, it's so strange. I, it could have been a mountain climber, uh, anything. I could have been the manager of a checkers. I, know. I picked comedian just out of the blue. I was in a small Georgia town there wasn't a comedy club there, there was nothing there, so I decided that if you're gonna be a comedian, it's not the type of thing you dabble in, you jump in, just dive into the pool. So I moved to Atlanta. There's a comedy club there, that's where I need to be. I can't afford rent in Atlanta. And I gave away all my possessions, and I lived in my car. Looking back on it, there's little tricks that you maneuver, creativity, to get around the system. When you live in your car, you spend so many hours a day thinking, where can I take a shower? Where can I take a shower? After a month or so, I discovered this trick. I would find a small hotel, you know, the kind with 10 rooms, maybe. And I would park across the street from it, somewhere where no one really noticed me. And at 9 o'clock in the morning, the maids would come and open every door, just one by one, strip all the beds, take all the linens off. And I would just sit there quietly to myself, hidden, and I would just wait for those doors to open. And that's your chance. You have six or eight minutes that the maid is not around. It's just quick, it's just real quick like that. And you throw your clothes on, and by the time you're ready, they start banging. And I would always yell, I'll be out in a second, I'm running late. And that would confuse them. Like, I thought I opened all the doors. What happened? And then they would walk away. And that's when I, you run, you run to your car, and you're in and gone. And every single time, when you're starting that car, they're staring right at you. Like, what? What, you, you just took a shower for free? You could see that moment on their face when they realized you just stole a shower. One time, they were banging on the door, you know, and I was on the other side of it, listening to her footsteps, and I thought I heard her leave. And I, and I was going out like this, and I, and I looked to my right, and I see this very large woman. She had a broom, and she was maybe two doors down. She's going, you don't do that guy, screaming and yelling. And I went, oh my God. She was hitting me with this broom, just whacking me over the head. And I was laughing way too hard to get up. She was screaming at me, you don't be getting in my room like that, boy. You, don't, you ain't right in the head, you ain't right in the head. It was about maybe a year later, I was doing a show in Milledgeville, Georgia, a tiny little bar. And I walk up on stage, and the first thing I hear is, oh, no, oh, no, you ain't right, boy. You ain't right. And I look out, and she's in the audience. She did the whole show. She didn't think it was funny. I give homeless people money. Well, let me correct that. I give creative homeless people money. <laughs> I was in Philadelphia. Listen to this guy. Hey. Yeah, Philly? I'm walking down Baltic Avenue in Philly, right? There's a guy standing in front of the Holiday Inn. Homeless guy, Baltic Avenue, Holiday Inn. His sign said Baltic Avenue plus one hotel. You owe me a dollar. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? You have to give that man a dollar. Yeah. I saw the sign, I said, all right, buddy, here, do not pass go. There you go. Boston, elderly homeless man, long gray beard down to his waist. ZZ Top's cousin. This guy just walks up to me and goes, excuse me, you want to hear my story? I said, hell yeah. He goes, I've been trying to get into Harvard for 52 years. I said, what has been holding you back? He goes, about $295,000. Two bucks I gave that man. I said, all right, man, here's two bucks. You put that money towards your education. San Francisco, I turned the corner of a building. Homeless guy sitting cross-legged on the sidewalk. It's a cool looking guy, completely bald, not a stitch of hair up top, but he had two giant sideburns. They just started and went down. He looked like he was in parentheses. I turned that corner, I went, 
that is the coolest head on a human that I've ever seen in my entire life. He's sitting on the sidewalk. He stunk like hell. I could smell him standing up. He had a cup waving it, need help written on it. He looked up and he goes, hey man, I want your opinion on something. It's been bothering me. Would you agree with me that a hand basket's just way too frilly a thing to go to hell in? <laughs> what the fuck? Three bucks I gave him. I said, you know what? You're right. Here's one for the story and one for each burn. New York City. That's where they send the homeless to train. <laughs> packed sidewalk, packed with people. Guy sticks his face right in mine. He shoved it right there. I'm from the South. It scared the shit out of me. <laughs> he did that. I went, fuck, I'm dead. <laughs> I turned to look at him. He had a dog mask on. A dog, he started barking right in my face. I meowed and ran like hell. And he chased me. God, I was so happy. I could hear him behind <laughs> I'm running fools. <laughs> he tackled me on the sidewalk. Bam, I gave him $10. I'm laying there, I'm sweating, I'm minus 10 bucks, and I'm laughing my ass off. Some guy walks by and goes, you know, if he could run, he could work. <laughs> what? He is wearing a dog mask. That level of creativity is unemployable. Where's dog boy gonna, I got fired from the fucking Dairy Queen. Stuart Huff. He's originally from Campbellsville, Kentucky. But we saw him and we went, boy, I can immediately use this guy virtually anywhere. What he does is pretty clean, it's clever, it's his own. This is the kind of person we want to support. Kristen Key got to us out of last comic standing because it's still called show business. And I have to have people that I can promote. She's a preacher's kid gone bad. Oh, Louisville, Kentucky, swear to God, yeah! I've been all over the country, I've seen 42 states, I've been to Alaska, I've been to Hawaii, but there is nowhere I would rather be than Louisville on a Saturday night. Wait, that's called blowing shit straight up your ass. That ain't true at all, everybody in this room would rather be in Hawaii right now, wouldn't you? Drinking a pina colada, smoking some weed. Those people would be smoking weed. Everybody else will be telling on us. What they don't tell you about pot is that pot is different in different regions of the country. I thought that Amarillo, Texas dirt weed was good pot. I moved to California where they have good pot. And everything changed. Because I remember in Texas, like you'd smoke pot and want to like mm, eat some food and watch cartoons. Whoopee! <laughs> I smoked that good pot in California. Holy shit, I had to kick everybody out of my apartment, stare at my closet, and make sure my pants were still there. <laughs> Mild paranoia is when you get scared of things that make sense. You know, like, like the cops are gonna come because they're telepathic. Or your mom's gonna call and smell it through the phone. <laughs> smoked that good pot, I, I got major paranoia. Like, I got scared of food that had faces on it. <laughs> you don't think about it very often, but packaging companies put people's heads on your food all the time. You know, when you're normal, it's no big deal. You're stoned, your kitchen can become a very frightening place. <laughs> I turned the corner, I was like, yeah, Uncle Ben, quit eyeballing me, bitch, that's my rice. <laughs> now they're everywhere. You got the Chiquita banana lady, the Quaker Oats man trying to convert me. <laughs> Little Debbie looks like a little whore. I lost my shit when I saw Mrs. Butterworth. <laughs> She's the bottle, you know. Syrup's no fun anymore when you're pouring somebody's life juice onto your pancakes. <laughs> Out of her head hole. I screwed her head back on, you know, and then I put her in the very back of my refrigerator because I didn't want to have to look at her. I felt too guilty. 
you know, and I shut the door and I came back every time. Like, she was like the Rosa Parks of my fridge. <laughs> like, how did you get back to the fight? <laughs> there were a lot of ministers in my family. My, my dad's a preacher, and his dad's a preacher, and his dad was a preacher. So, I guess if I were a boy, I probably would have been a preacher. I, I would have definitely been a preacher. Women weren't supposed to speak in church, so I, I do this instead. Um... I don't, know, I don't think I do anything like like inspiring or holy or anything like that, but I mean I do make people laugh and I think dad dad's doing what he was meant to do and and I'm I'm doing this. So so it, I still think about him every time before I walk on stage. And his dad I think taught him how to be a good man. Um, my grandfather, he's also one of the most patient people I know. And his father, I didn't really know that well. I I just have very few memories of him, but he was actually the, the person that I told my, my very first joke to. They took me to go see him when he was dying, so this was a deathbed memory. I didn't know what to say to him, and my parents were like, well, why don't you tell him a joke? And I only knew one joke in the whole wide world, so, so I told him the only joke I knew. I, I got up real close, and I, I sat on his bed, and I said, okay, there was a guy, and he went to go buy a horse. And the guy selling the horse says, well, we only got one horse, but you may not want it, because it's a very religious horse. And the guy's like, well, I'm in a hurry, so give me the horse. And so he's like, well, it's, it's kind of important that you remember that it's a religious horse. The guy's like, whatever, I don't care, give me the horse. So he's like, okay, okay, well, um, if you want to make the horse go, you have to say hallelujah, and if you want to make the horse stop, you have to say amen. The guy's like, whatever, I'm in a hurry. So he takes the horse, he gets on him, and he's like, come on, I'm in a hurry. Giddy up, horse, and he's kicking him, and the horse doesn't move, of course, because this guy wasn't paying attention. So he's like, you know, kicking him everything, and the horse doesn't move. And so finally he's like, oh, yeah, it's a religious horse. Um, Hallelujah. And then the horse just takes off in a dead run, just galloping and galloping and galloping, and he's going really, really fast, and the guy can't get him to stop, and there's a cliff coming up, and he's going faster than he's ever been on a horse. It's like, whoa, slow down, horse. Like, stop, horse. Like, fuck off. You know, quit, quit going so fast, and, you know, whoa, and pulling on the reins, and the horse isn't stopping for shit. And so he's thinking, he's like, I'm going to die. I'm going to fall off the edge of this cliff. So he's like, oh, Jesus, if you just spare me from falling off the edge of this cliff, I swear to God, uh, in Jesus' name, amen. And the horse Arr! stops his little horsey toenails just hanging off the edge of the cliff, and that guy's so relieved. He goes, whoo, hallelujah. That's the first joke I ever told. Here's this tall, thin, good-looking young woman. Um, and most women that I see on stage are kind of imitating what guys do in stand-up, because it is such a male profession. So here she is, and you know, she could be doing the usual schlaw, but she's really presenting like this kind of very hyper-critical persona that so she I has. Said, that purpose. isn't her persona off stage, but is her on stage persona, and she fully inhabits it. See, comedians don't tell jokes. People constantly come up to comedians and want to tell them jokes. Comedians don't tell jokes. It's observational humor. It's the comedian's view of all the things around them. It's not knock knock or uh, two guys walk into a bar. That's not what comedians do. It is far more observational humor, and I'd much rather somebody have something to say. You have a voice, you have a consistent attitude, you have something to say. That's comedy. Tim was a finalist on Star Search for $100,000. For $100,000, his opening joke with that two minutes on Star Search was, My name is Tim Northern. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. That's my hometown. I am the product of a biracial marriage. My father was African-American, and my mother was black. So, uh, that's, what I got. that's what I got going for me. Find out my grandfather was colored. So, you know, so, you know, I'm dealing with that and stuff. As a kid, my family, we were funny. We had a funny family, not just looking. <laughs> but we were funny. My father was uh, very witty, and my mother was, was really silly, you know. I remember the first time I realized what stand-up comedy was. My uncle, he came over to my house with an album, Richard Pryor album. I was nine, I remember. He asked my father if he wanted to hear it, and he's like, yeah. He said, what about the kids? He was like, like hell, they, they've heard me use those words before, you know? So he's like, okay. So uh, my brother and I listened to it with them, and, um, and it was funny, man. I mean, half of it, I didn't know what they were talking about. But, uh, but the one half that was funny, that I did know, I just knew it was funny. And I thought to myself, this, this is brilliant. I mean, a guy, can talk, just talk for an hour and make people laugh. I'm thinking, man, I, that's, this is something I would love to do, and I didn't know how to do it. At 19 years old in Nashville, Tennessee, they opened a new club, Zany's, a comedy club, first comedy club we had. And 
that's during the, the big comedy boom in the 80s. And they had an open mic, so I, you know, I said, I'm gonna try it. And I thought I did okay, but I mean, I'm 19, you know. These people are so much older than me, they gotta be at least in their 20s. I figured I had some living to do. And so uh, I did some living. And uh, 27, I came back when I was 27. I used to uh, stay up late at night trying to read until I found out I was, uh, what you call it, uh, illiterate. So, <laughs> so I took a class to learn how to read. Oh, you read, man? Look at you. Show one off. Can you read, sir? Okay. Two of y'all. That's good. Man. I learned last year, man. I mean, we were in class, we were working on this thing, it was called, uh, it was called Silent E. That's stupid. How are you going to be a letter in a word and be silent? I see you. I'm going to stop using Silent E. I'll say it. I hack Silent E. I just don't lick it. <laughs> Silent is a stupid man. Silent G. Silent K. Silent B, that's just dumb, if you think about what I'm saying. Silent B is dumb as hell. Okay. I guess I'm not the only one that needs to take that class. <laughs> I guess that joke was a little too subtle for some of y'all to pick up on. Uh, okay. When I first started, I would drive 20 hours straight. Now, I can't do 20 hours straight. I have to get a hotel, you know, split up my trips. Uh, I fly more than I used to. You know, a lot of people want to, you know, is it hard to have a family to do this? And I say, no, if you got a good family, if you got good intentions, then you're going to make it work. There's very few guys that aspirations are, all I want to do is work the road. Early on, the young guys think that that would be great. God, if I could just fill my calendar with 50 weeks of work, it'd be my paradise. They do that two or three years, it's a tough life. It's not as glamorous. A lot of uh, lonely nights in a hotel room, a lot of driving for 10 hours and having a horrible set and having to drive back or drive another five hours to your next gig. If my son told me he wanted to be a stand-up comic, I would absolutely tell him, I'm not letting you. I'm not allowing it. If they're in B rooms, they have any B rooms that haven't moved out of that. And this is what I call like the road dogs that have been doing this for a long time. The guys that get in their car and drive 250 miles to another gig and start on Wednesday and work through the whole week. And then the following week they do the same thing and drive to another gig. Well, they're making a living, yet they have to pay for their car, their insurance, their gas. So, you know, it's, it's an okay living. But, you know, I would suspect that you might want to move along a little bit. You know, I mean, it's... It, there are circuits out there that, you know, these guys have been on for a long time and, you know, they continue to, to, to be on it. I don't know if it does a, a service to them or not. I don't, yeah, to me, it doesn't. You know, it doesn't do them any good. Well, comics aren't going to hear this, but it has to thin out. There's just not enough work and there's too many guys just trying to hang on to their dream right now. So there was this big comedy boom that everyone talks about. It's kind of like an origin myth for stand-up comedy. We went from like 10 clubs in 1980 to 500 clubs in 1985. The 80s was the comedy explosion. Lots more clubs, lots more comics, and then the crash came around between 92 and 95, where there were too many people who weren't really artists trying to make a buck doing comedy or just have a good time really doing comedy and it couldn't hold, couldn't hold the audiences. Clubs started closing and comedians went into other fields. The clubs have, have limited their times. A lot of them are only open, you know, Thursdays through Saturdays. So you don't get that, that, that much time, that much stage time. Stage time really makes you better, period. That's the bottom line. If you want to be a comedian, that is your desire. You need stage time. You've got to get up. It's the only way you're going to get better. Like if you're a painter, you can sit in the room and work. A comedian, you've got to get in front of people. 
And when I started, that's a hard thing to let somebody else put you on stage because you are bad. So why would anybody put you up, you know? So I signed up at the Punchline in Atlanta, Georgia. I signed up 12 weeks in a row. And there is, like, Tuesday night was open mic night. They put up four people on Tuesday night. And I would wake up Tuesday thinking, maybe I'd get up tonight, you know? And it's such anxiety. You're so excited and frightened, scared to death. And then 8 o'clock, I'm not going up. So it was just like every week, it was like, I might get up, and you'd have to wait seven days to find out I'm not going up again. So I, one day I just decided, why do I have to do this in a comedy club? What is the rule? Was there some kind of law that says there has to be comedy written on the building for people to enjoy my horrible jokes? People can enjoy uh, my stupidity anywhere. You know, so I don't know what it was, but I just decided I'm gonna, I can go up anywhere I want. So I started going up at Kmart. I'd stand Kmart, 2 a.m. I'd stand in the electronics department and just stand there, you know, with my notebook. So, uh, and people would, I'd just tell jokes, that's it. You know, and people would, they never came close to me, but they'd always, you'd always see a head over a rack of clothes or something looking. And occasionally someone would come over and go, what are you, what are you doing? And I would tell them, honestly, I would say, look, I'm trying to be a comedian and I'm, I'm trying out my jokes. And they would always say, well, sometimes they would say, all right, let's hear them. Come on. And I'd tell them a joke and then they'd be like, I understand why you're at Kmart. But you know, that's the thing. America, we love success, don't we? And it's a shame to me because failure's beautiful. <laughs> failure's so great. It is, like every success story that there is, is whatever, bland and boring. And then there's a whole stream of failures that is fucking interesting as shit. <laughs> People trying stuff that didn't work is so much better to me than trying it and it did work. The Wright Brothers. Wright Brothers, big success story, defeated gravity. Fuck them, they suck. <laughs> All they did was screw up a good time. That's it. You ever seen that old footage of people trying to fly before they got it? <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? There's a guy like, honey, I have a barrel and two curtains. <laughs> I'm solid, push my ass off the mountain. <laughs> That's so much better. There's a guy with ice skates on with a rocket pack strapped to his back. <laughs> Holy shit. I would have been right behind him with a lighter. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Like, are you ready, man? <laughs> what? No, it's gonna work. You're gonna fly your ass off, buddy. <laughs> He's got ice skates on. That's a genius. Who put who puts that together? Who looks at blueprints of flight and says, where the fuck are my skates? <laughs> it's beautiful. And the Wright brothers took off, right? And ruined it. You see what I'm saying? They killed the creativity because all we do now is stand in line holding our shoes. <laughs> technology. My brother got me a GPS system for Christmas and uh, I cannot figure out how to make it give me directions. I can just change its accent. <laughs> so right now it can tell me I'm lost in four languages. <laughs> and I don't understand why they pick the languages they do. But like an Australian male. Man, I, he, he distracts me. <laughs> he sounds like Hugh Jackman in interviews. I'm trying to drive. He's like, hey there, tin lift. I'm like, ha <laughs> ha. Okay. <laughs> Ten right on Hollywood Boulevard. I'm like, ah, oh, Wolverine. <laughs> no fair. I have heated seats and I can't multitask. <laughs> then when it comes to American, who do we have? We have this chick called American Jill. Pike one miles, turn right. I'm like, why pick that accent to represent all of America? We have so many fun accents out here. Like, why not pick something we all know? Like, like where's the redneck white trash GPS lady? <laughs> She'd be fun to ride around with. Just turn left at the light, look out for that cow. Woo! <laughs> she doesn't tell you to go straight. She tells you, Duke's a hazard in the overpass. Come on, pussy. <laughs> 
She hadn't even run off a battery. She runs off a liquor in Paul Malls. <laughs> East Coast could have their own GPS lady, but she'd be all kinds of bitchy. Hey, girl, here's what you're going to do. You're going to turn left at the light, go into Sal's Donut Shop. But hey, you, you missed your fucking turn. <laughs> go up to Minnesota, let them have their own GPS lady. She'd be by far the, the friendliest GPS lady of them all. You know, like, oh, yeah, sure, I know how to get there. That's a super destination. Okay. <laughs> Let me think. Okay, now you're going to go two miles. You're going to pass a red barn, then a Walmart. Oh, God. Oh, no. Oh, crap. Oh, no. Oh, you should probably turn around. <laughs> At least once a year, I would drive from Amarillo, Texas to Missoula, Montana. That's a 24-hour car ride. That was the beginning of a tour that would last four weeks. About eight hours between gigs. You drive your ass off during the day to get there in time. And you show up and you shower and you get to the gig and they tell you you're late. You do an hour and then they they get you so fucked up on alcohol that you, you're like, God, and you sleep for about three or four hours, you wake up the next morning and drive another eight hours. And that is every day for four weeks. You come off that tour going, oh, I should go back to college. And then about a week later, you go, no, no, I'm back in it. I'm, yeah. Continue point five miles, then turn left on East 3rd Street. I, uh, I have a friend that looks just like an owl. Just like an owl. I went up to him, I was like, hey man, somebody thinks you look just like an owl. He said, <laughs> can, I, can I finish? Can I, can I, can I finish? <laughs> anyway, he said, uh, What person or persons may have said such a thing about me, man? <laughs> then he flew away. <laughs> yeah, my jokes, man, they're like, they're like crossword puzzles, you know? Like, I, I'll give you the clue and, uh, and the grid and then you gotta figure out what words to put in there, you know? Like a lot of people, I like, I like that people try to beat me to the punch. They think they know where I'm going, but they don't know where I'm going, you know? And I like it, uh, because that, it shows me that people are engaged and they like games, you know? I, 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 I love games. And, uh, and also, uh, it shows me that, they, that they, want, they want it smart. I think a lot of people want it smart, smarter than the industry, um, I mean clubs and television, smarter than, than either one of those think that the audience is wrong. Um, it was once said, uh, Ben Stein, when I was on Star Search, I, I don't want to mention that, but I was on Star Search, and Ben Stein said, I like the fact that you assume the audience has a brain. And I do. And there are too many, there are too many people in this industry, performers and club owners and managers, that, that don't, that think the audiences are stupid, that think the masses are stupid. And I don't think so. They, it's, it's like they want them to stay stupid. Because it's like a comedy club is a stage. It's a bar with a stage. And I'm tired. They're selling whiskey, and I'm tired of selling that whiskey for them. I when is it going to be about me selling the funny? You know? Uh, there's a thing in the industry that they call paper in a room, which is giving away the room just so they can get the bodies in to sell the whiskey. It's not, it's not, it's not that they want the people to be invested in uh, what's going on on stage. It's that they would much rather give away the room just to get the bodies in to sell the whiskey. And it's not about the funny anymore, you know? It's not about the funny. My rent is $25,000 a month here, and I have to have people in my seats. I can't sit with 30 people in my club on a Friday, Saturday night. I have to have it full. Comedians have no business running a business, and they don't understand. They think they might think they understand how to run a business, and there is kind of a us against them mentality when it comes to that. I was never a comedian. Do I like comedy? I like comedy, but 
What excites me is the business part of it. I also do it for the art, but business is first. My crowd has to have a good time. I like guys who I feel are going to have a career in comedy. I like guys that are bright, that bring it, you know, can make people laugh, are somewhat edgy, and, you know, can pretty much relate to a lot of people. There are some comics who I think are absolutely brilliant that I can't work in my room because my crowd isn't going to like them. I have to think business first before I think of what I like. The thing is, I'd rather there be comedy than not be any. You know, the problem with us is that I don't want people to see comics that are bad and look at it as a reflection on the rest of comedy clubs, okay? They really have to go to the good rooms to see what is really happening. It's okay to go to the back room in your bar and to watch comedy, but if you're really gonna see what's happening, you need to go to a club. You have to pursue your passions, and that's true with the comics too. You've gotta to pursue your passion. Other than that, you're a whore. And there are whores out there. And they're hacks. And they're hacks getting rich while geniuses starve to death. But that's always been the way it is in the entertainment industry. And again, that's back to where we started. It's not who you know, it's who knows you. I'm on the road 45 weeks a year, different towns almost every week. And I hit junk shops every day, you know? And it's a lot of people drink, a lot of comics, they, they like to drink, they, they party, it's, they go out at bars after the show and then they sleep all day. This is my alcohol. This is my party. I, I'll hit a town, I'll go to Johnson City, Tennessee, wherever. And I'll, I'll check in my hotel room, pull the yellow pages out. Hit antiques. I'm looking for the word junk. I want the word, you know, thrift, junk, your Windsor antique places. I don't, I don't want any of that stuff, you know. I don't want a mint with my, my trip. I want an American plastic piece of shit. I love the back road. I was born in Campbellsville, Kentucky. There's a pump and munch in Campbellsville. You walk in, the man behind the counter has on a midriff shirt. <laughs> Shirt? No. <laughs> the glass case is my absolute favorite. I don't know what it is. Every, every choke and puke has to lock up the good shit. The ginseng. The horny goat weed pills. Sword. It's a samurai sword and a pumping munch, guys. What kind of an impulse buy is that? <laughs> People just strolling in. Give me 40 bucks on pump two. Give me that sword. <laughs> I've been walking around with this empty sheath. I looked at the sword and I looked at the guy and I said, have you ever sold any of those? Like you ever had to reorder the swords? He's like, what? <laughs> when would I need to own a sword? When would I need that? He looked me dead in the eye and goes, hell, when you need it, you'll know it. I was 16, 17, digging through these bins of like quarter records, you know, and I found a Bob Newhart record. And I love that show, Newhart. So I was like, I didn't even know he did comedy. So I bought the Bob Newhart record, and it is phenomenal. You're listening to Bob Newhart stutter quietly in your room. It feels doable. And then, I don't know, I found a Woody Allen record. I loved his movies, love Woody Allen movies. You feel like, you know, Woody Allen's nervous. I didn't know at the time he's, he created an amazing character. But I thought it was real. He hooked me. I really thought, oh, he's scared. Holy crap, I could be scared too. You know, I could do this. I really felt like this is doable. Eddie Murphy was in front of 5,000 people wearing a leather red suit. How do you go from I had pimples and braces to wearing a leather suit in front of 3,000 people? That's a chasm. But I could be nervous and stutter, you know? and meander around a bit and be a nerd. The problem, 
TV has with Stuart is Stuart is a storyteller, and his story take a while to get to. It's funny through the whole story, but the bit is long. I think Stuart's shortest story is six minutes long. Well, you get four and a half on The Tonight Show or Letterman, okay? So it won't work. And Lord knows I've tried to get him on a bunch of TV shows. I think he's one of the most brilliant comics that was working today. And people that know comedy and, and really appreciate comedians love Stuart. They truly do. But, you know, for people that run television and, and know that it has to be joke, 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 it Stuart doesn't work for them. Why would the TV scouts and people who make decisions there not choose these comics? Why would they not want to go out, the, out of the box a little and give their audiences something that's unexpected? really can't answer that. All I want to be is a comic. The one on the TV show, the one on the film, straight up comedy. The only way you can make it these days is, you know, film or television. I mean, you can't just do it on straight stand-up comedy unless you fit into a category, unless you're like, a, I'm a BET comic. You know, I'm a black guy. I'm extra blackity black, you know. Or you can be like, uh, like, you know, have a guitar, guitar act. Look at me, man. I'm playing the guitar, man. I'm a guitar comic, you know. But other than that, I mean, if you're just straight funny, you can't, there's no way, you know. You can go to L.A. But, or New York, you know. But, I mean, they, always, they already know what they want. They already have a category, you know. And then, like, Comedy Central, or, or they'll, what they'll do, what Comedy Central will do, they'll say, we're looking for the next funny guy, the next big funny guy. And then they'll go to Texas and pick a New York guy. What is that, man? That's not about funny, you know. I don't fit into a category. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't really think I, I don't want to be in a category. Well, unless the category is funny. Started working out this year, man. Started working out. 07, I learned to read. 07 was about the mind. 08 is about the body. For real, man. Started working out. Started running. But that was too hard. So then I started walking. That was too slow, so uh, so now I skip on a regular basis. <laughs> I was tough at first, you know. I would lose my balance. <laughs> so I got me a trainer. You know. yeah. Then he would hold my hand and show me the proper technique, you know, of skipping. You know, because he was eight. <laughs> so now I'm skipping on my own. I skip like three miles a day. Well, actually, I skip on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. <laughs> Every other weekend. But I tell you, when you're skipping, your body releases endorphins and dopamine. So often, while I'm skipping, hey, I'm smiling. <laughs> yeah. That's got an added benefit. Not only am I getting my cardio, but uh, people get right the hell out of my way. I want to be my words when I'm on stage. Makes me smile even more, man. man. I don't want to be Tim Northern. I want people to focus on what I'm saying. I want it to be all about the words. It's like in The Wizard of Oz, you know, pay no attention to the man behind the curtains. I don't want to yell at you. You know, not like, not like in anger, you know, like it's, you know, like, it's all about me. Look at me, I'm on stage telling these jokes. You know, look at me, it's all about me. That's not what I want, that's not what I'm going after at all. It's not about my ego when I'm up here. So when I'm up there, I'm trying to be like someone they can relate to, kind of like Joe Everybody. I don't know, I love being on stage, it's weird. Because, like, I feel like I'm a different person up there. Like, in real life, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm kind of polite, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm nice to people. When I'm on stage, I'm kind of a bitch, and it's weird. But I like getting to be that, I, get, I like getting to turn into somebody else. <laughs> Los Angeles has sushi and all this fancy food and shit, but they don't have a Waffle House anywhere in town. I know, I'm upset about it. And they made fun of me when I said, you know, where's your Waffle House? They're like, hey, oh, what's a Waffle House? <laughs> so you're talking to me like I'm stupid, you don't know what a fucking Waffle House is? I was trying to explain to her, I was like, you know, every town has one similar. It's, it's, they, they just name it something else, but it's where you go at like three o'clock in the morning when maybe you drink too much or you smoke too much. That's just where the cab takes you when they can't fucking understand you. <laughs> it's happened to me a few times. You get in the back of the cab, I, I don't blame the driver because you get in the back of the cab and they're like, wherever do you like to go tonight? You say, ah-ha! <laughs> 
Wobble House it is. <laughs> I love the Wobble House. Not just the food, they got great food. They're world famous, of course, for the waffles and those hash browns. You can get your hash browns scattered, smothered, motherfuckered up. <laughs> I don't even know what motherfuckered up means. I think it's with chili. <laughs> but the best part is not the food. It's not the food. The best part is the uh, the ambiance. <laughs> I mean the wait staff, the people that work there. What an interesting barrel of circus freaks these people are. <laughs> Holy shit! Some guy greets you at the door, he's just got legs, arms, and teeth pointing every which way. Welcome to Wobble House! I don't mean to be rude, buddy, but how are you even alive? And they're all so friendly there. They're all friendly. What do they say any time of day? Morning! It's four in the afternoon. Morning! I think those are the ones that only have two words that they can say, and that's morning and coffee! That's all they got. But they do get friendly with you. Those waitresses get real friendly. Any other restaurant you go to, the wait staff gets kind of personal with you, so you tip them more. Like, hi, welcome to Outback. My name's Judy. Would you like an awesome blossom? I have a daughter. I'll be right back. <laughs> right, so you tip her an extra buck because she has a she has a daughter. Now at a Waffle House, they will get uncomfortably personal with you. Tell you a little bit too much about themselves before they even take your drink order. Right? And they don't come up quietly. They scare the shit out of you with that morning shit. So they're trying to color on our menu. Next thing they know, Martin, welcome to Waffle House. My name's Trish. Do you want sweet or unsweet tea? I'm only working here until I get my kids back. I used to have a meth problem. I'll be right back. So I started doing stand-up when I was 19 years old in Amarillo, Texas. I remember I went to an open mic night on a Wednesday, and I absolutely fell in love with it. I did my set. I put the mic back in the mic stand. I went home like with all these thoughts in my head and I, I quit my job, I quit college, and I thought this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. When I first started out, I just wanted to do some jokes in a comedy club in front of an audience and for them to laugh at me. And then after I did that a while, my biggest dream was to, to do comedy on you know the big stage where you walk out from behind this curtain and you see this TV audience, you know, and you tell your jokes and they love it or whatever. And I got to be on TV, so I got that moment. And so now I spend most of my time trying to figure out, well, what do I want now? People always ask me the same thing. Is it true? And I always say, probably. I travel all over the country. I meet people. I watch things. I see things. And I cherry pick. Something happens and I go, that, right there. That's what I want. And I pluck it out. And I move it away from all this. And then I build it over here. My act is not about what the world is. It's about what the world could be. That's when I'm happy. When, when I, my best shows are when I believe it. You know what I mean? Like I'm here, I'm about to go on stage and I'm right here. And I actually believe that the world could be like I want it to be. Those are my best shows and I can't wait. I can't wait to go out there and, and say, look at what I found. Look at this. We can all do this if we want to. You know, and my worst shows when I don't feel it. And I can't fake it. Some guys, some guys can just turn it on like a switch, you know, and they can just go out there and be, I can't do it, I don't know why. I'm, I get depressed, you know, and I don't believe it, and that's when it's just not good. I'm an observer of life. I'm not a participator, you know, and then I come out here and I tell you what I found. Is it true? Like this thing lately, I've been talking about this beautiful bird. It's just this little bird and it, it, it wants its mating ritual or whatever. It builds a nest for two, and, and it takes time and just delicately puts it all together, you know? And it flies around, and it collects blue objects, and it places them the, exactly the way he wants them in front of this nest, and then he dances. When the female comes around, he, he just puffs up and he dances his little ass off. And I'm, I'm too insecure to do that. That is not who I am. In my living room, I'm working on this bit, you know what I mean? I'm writing down all the details, and then I actually wrote down, I'm not lying, I actually wrote down, and I will dance here. Because I couldn't practice it, because it was me in my living room. But when I go here, it is not me. This isn't me. Th this is the bird. I'm, I'm the bird right here. 
and I want to dance. When I'm the bird, I want the bird to dance like he's already got her. He's already got her, now he's just impressing her. That's all it is. No matter how many times he gets rejected, that's what I want, all of it. And that's what it's all about to me. Everything I've ever talked about, everything, everything that, you know, the people trying to fly, it's, it's so passionate, you know? They're giving it their all, you know? The bird, the flight, the kid with the, the gear shift and the cobra head, all of it's the same thing to me. Is it true? Probably. This is the comic killer. It's a dangerous thing, not for <laughs> professionals only. I tried those Breathe Right strips. They don't work, Excuse but what? Excuse me. Just... Excuse me? Oh, okay. Excuse me. Okay. Yeah. Excuse me. I'm sorry. A man walked into a bar and said, ouch. You're gonna have to do that one. <laughs> you just said that. I kind of like that. What's he doing? I feel, uh oh. Is it me or all the McDonald's around town starting to look like big hamster cages? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> really, at the end of the day, you'll never be. Yes! Taking a screwdriver in your butt and laughing and running naked through the living room. No. no. You can't write you funny. Can't. Yeah. It's impossible. <laughs> Since I met you to this day, my chances of being famous are zilch. When we met, I had about a 7% chance of actually somebody not showing up for Letterman and I happened to be hanging out smoking a cigarette out back and they went holy shit get in here it was like a <laughs> seven percent chance and now there is zilch it is not happening they everybody has said you are not getting on television with your material is way too long so now you can enjoy it more now just I doing can, this I'm just this is what I do this is what I want to say I know that the consequences of what I do tonight are I'm happy and they're happy. Oh and it's God. going no further than that. Yeah. Love you that. know? So I can just I like that. See, I love that. That's that's we had an ex shared experience here and you made people happy and you were happy. I love that. Let's do more things like that.